So um, I'm not going to take a real long time for the message. The Bible's important, and we got to get the word. But we also are talking today about a demonstration of our actions matching up with our faith, right? In, in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus is finishing up the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are those who don't just hear what I say, but do what I say. And in, in a modern day church, you could show up once a week, you could put your money in the offering, and, and, and that's basically the, the, the level of engagement is just coming to church. But I think we would be doing you a great disservice if we told you that that is the full engagement that the Lord would want, because the Lord wants us to put our hand to the plow and actually do things in addition to say things. It's not just theory. Um, and part of the doing is not to earn our salvation. We can't earn our salvation with works, but it's to remind ourselves what the priorities are. And let's be honest, we are very privileged people uh, as far as the planet goes. We Our, our level, our, our uh, the level of uh, quality of life that we have is very high compared to billions of other people in the world. But it's easy to forget that. It's easy to only look at the people who are doing better than us and think that we're, we're not doing well. And, and, and the Lord just warns us over and over and over about that. And one of the ways he warns us about it is to say, help the people that can't help themselves. That's what I want my church to do. I want my church to be known for helping people, which is really what a missionary does, right? We were in Mozambique with Heidi Baker, and the missionaries that were there didn't have much, and they didn't need anything. And they said, my wife said, how long do you have to stay here? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, what do you mean? This is, this is the final stop on the train for us. This is what we want to do. And, and that wasn't Trisha's calling, and that's fine. We all have our own, but like, he constantly pushes us back to this idea that we're here to also wash people's feet. And, and because, but for the grace of God, I'm the person who needs the help, right? And I said in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, I think it's often misunderstood when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, it's not blessed are just the poor with no money. It's people that are broken about something. Cindy just talked about the worst thing that can happen. You lose a child. Having to bury a child has to be one of the hardest things anyone could ever have to grieve. Blessed are those people? Not because of the terrible thing that happened, but because they have access to the kingdom of God in the midst of that. The whole Sermon on the Mount is about access to the kingdom of God through his church and through parachurch ministries. But we can't think that just coming and, and absorbing information and teaching is it. We also have to put our hand to the plow, in my opinion. And I have the mic, so you're stuck. <laughs> but I'll try to prove it in the Bible as well. And I've been quoting this verse in relation to feeding hands um, as, as a worship leader right from the very beginning when I first got saved. I had been involved with music, and, and I heard about this guy named David. Didn't even know when I was a kid. I was watching a puppet cartoon called Davy and Goliath. Had no idea it was about the Bible. <laughs> they were getting the word in there, too, right, even back then. And then, you know, you study about David and King David, and he had such a mixed record of good and bad things that he did. But he was a man after God's own heart. He was a worshiper. He played the guitar. Let me just straighten that out for you right now. He was a guitar player. <laughs> Because a harp is just a, a guitar turned sideways, right? Like that. It's very obvious to anybody that that would be true. But he had said something at one point in Scripture when he had made a really bad mistake and God was bringing a punishment over, over Jerusalem. And, and, and I'll get into that a little bit today about what that was. And somebody offered to give him, this is the, actually the pictures of the threshing floor that David was told to buy to build an altar to the Lord. And the man said, I'll give it to you for free. And David said, no, that's not how this works. I won't offer something to the Lord that doesn't cost me anything. I have to pay you for this field. And that's a beautiful principle. And, and we should all remember that, that but for the grace of God, we could be in a real mess. If we're not in a real mess, we have to remember that to whom much is given, right? It's not like this, oh, well, I did it through my own hard work, and too bad for them. They didn't work hard, but I did. No, no, but for the grace of God. And don't forget that. And uh, that's the first verse I want to give you. It's right in Deuteronomy 8. And this is as the children of Israel going in out of, the, out of the desert and into the promised land. In verse 11 of Deuteronomy 8, it says, Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God. 
by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and you live in those houses and when your herds and flocks and silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord. Be careful. That can happen today. It can happen to Christians. The, the media is very good at always putting something in front of us that's a little more than we can afford to get us to get in debt and put it on our credit card and buy it because we need that thing. Well, you want that thing, but you probably don't need it. <laughs> don't get a lot of amens on that one, but that's, we got to work on that, Nate. You lay hands on some people. <laughs> and then he says, whoo, this is a big one, Moses, right? He, he knew how to warn people. He was, he was like the pastor's pastor. You know, he had just so many disgruntled people. And at one point he said to God, if you really love me, you just kill me now. <laughs> I can't take these people anymore. <laughs> it's called sheep bites when you're a pastor. But this is what Moses said. Beware lest you say in your heart that my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. It's a danger for all of us. And yes, of course, we could have more. We could live in bigger houses. We could drive nicer cars. But boy, when you think about where we stand relative to the rest of the planet, there's seven plus billion people that don't have it as good as you do. <laughs> right? Wow. And that's, that's the picture God sees. Right? There's always someone else who would love to be in your shoes. That's one of the lyrics of a song that my wife gave me when I was first saved. It's called Be Grateful. Be grateful. There's always someone else that would love to be in your shoes. Hmm. So this is what happened to David. Now Satan stood up against Israel, moved David to number Israel, 1 Chronicles 21. Okay, so that's the attack. Allow his ego to rise up because he's proud of how things are going. This is a little speculation, but not really, not really all that much because as it goes down, it says, David says to Joab and to the leaders, Israel, go number Israel, take a census from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them back to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, who's a very astute guy, he said, may the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, David, king, are they not all your Lord? Aren't they all your servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? There was rules about taking a census, and David was now taking it on himself for his own ego, it appears, to need to know that. And what, the way the rule was, if you just I'll go back into Exodus chapter 30, in verse 12, it says, when you take a census of the population of Israel, each person should pay a ransom to me, says the Lord. Hmm. So there's this connection, and there's this covenant, and there's this acknowledgement that we're a nation as Israel because of the Lord. That's what connects us all together. And if, there's, if that's going to happen, I want you to receive this payment, like a tax, but it's, the word is, used, is ransom. The rich will not pay more, the poor will not pay less, which is interesting, and the money will go to me in order to ransom your lives. Use it to provide for the service of the congregation tent. That's the tabernacle. To serve as a constant reminder of my covenant with Israel and provide a way to atone for your lives. So here's the deal. I'll kind of summarize it quickly. Is that the Lord wants to remind us that the reason that we're together and we have all these benefits and whatever uh, expression of worship that happened this morning where people were receiving the love of God and changing their thoughts and, and renewing their minds and like we said, walking out of here differently, understanding the heart of God better because we come together and we worship together. That's, that's a covenant with God. And, and we connect each other. And when they gave this offering, that money was specifically used to be put into the temple so they could be reminded of it. All right? So he said, the silver that was collected, this is just from a commentary, that ransom was employed for making the sockets which supported the boards of the tabernacle and the pillars in the veil, together with the hooks and the pillars of the court, so that as long as the tabernacle stood, the precious metal that those people paid as a ransom, the money that they gave was turned into this part of it. It remained in the sight of the people and was a continual memorial, to a reminder to them of the position which they were brought to because of God. Their covenant with God. Now David was taking that on himself. And God said, beware of that. Lest you start to think that my might and the power of my hand has got me into this position. 
And that's why something like feeding hands is really important because it gets our bodies in a different place. It gets us, instead of just making a donation and putting money in an envelope, we actually get our hands dirty. We actually take food out of a box and put it in a bag and, and we may never meet the person that's going to get it. But the fact that we were part of that process does something to our spirit, man. It reminds us that but for the grace of God, I could be the person that needs that food. I could be the person broken in spirit. You might get the chance to actually give them the food and ask them if you want to pray, if they want you to pray for them. I have to tell a quick story that I heard this week from Lois. And it was one of their volunteers who told the story about way back in, in the year 2001 after 9-11, she had decided to make a donation of Bibles or, or a package of Bibles to uh, a ministry. And she prayed over this one Bible that she had for, uh, I don't know, I guess it was her personal Bible. And she gave it and she said, Lord, may somebody who gets this find peace and comfort, is that the right words? Peace and comfort when they get this Bible. And she put it in the box and she sent it away and hadn't seen it. 16 years later... In 2017, she's volunteering for their ministry, and the place that they were at was a church, and the people would wait, like you are in here, they would wait in the chapel before they would go receive their food, and she liked to just pray with them. So she was there as kind of an evangelist. This would be my sister-in-law, Linda, here in our church. <laughs> she likes to talk to everybody, and she'll lead everybody to the Lord. If you, let, if you let her talk to people, they'll get saved. It's amazing. We hired a police officer at the other church. The guy was saved before he left the property. Just Amazing. What a gift. So that's this lady. She, anybody she gets a chance to talk to, she wants to pray. So she sits down next to this guy and, and says, can I pray for you? And he said, yes. And, and he said, well, do you have a Bible? And she said, he said, yes. In fact, I keep it right here. It brings me peace and comfort. <laughs> Pulls out the Bible, and it's her Bible that she had donated 16 years earlier. Okay? <laughs> what? What? Just a coincidence. <laughs> what? Never. No way. But if she hadn't been there making herself available to interact with another human being, that's very different than just writing a check, isn't it? Say yes. It'll go well for you if you say yes. <laughs> Faster to the bagels and coffee. Silver's important, right? And... Uh, because I've been in finance and I used to do a radio show, I was on, on, the, on the radio for a half hour a day for a couple of years back in the day when the radio was the main thing that people did to hear the word. So I really studied all the verses in the Bible about money. And you know, this point just kept ringing true to me that as part of our stewardship of a flock, it's important that the pastoral care team makes things available to you, that we vet the, the different ministries that, that, we're, that we're endorsing and say, yes, you can put your hand to this plow. This is good ground that you can get involved with because I didn't have the anointing to go start a food bank myself and run that whole thing for the last seven years the way they did. I don't even think they would have said that they had it either, but the Lord helped them and they just celebrated seven years. You know, that's a big deal, right? That's a big anniversary because eight is the year of New beginnings, and they're coming on this property in, in the year of new beginnings. That's really cool. And they're picking up a bunch of new people to, that are willing to help. But in Peter, he said, you know that a price was paid to redeem you from following the empty ways handed down to you by your ancestors, and it wasn't paid with things that perish like silver and gold. See, that's our taxes. That's our tithes. What was it paid with? You all know. The precious blood of the anointed who was like a perfect, unblemished, sacrificial lamb. So there's this anointing on Jesus to sacrifice his life. And that's part of what happens when we volunteer to do things. And there's really no payback in the natural. My wife and I used to go to a nursing home once a month on Sunday afternoons, and I would play the guitar and sing, and then we would pray with the people in the nursing home. And a couple people told us that we were the only people that ever visited them. <laughs> And then we went back one month and a lady that we had prayed for had died, right? And we knew uh, that our efforts were making a difference. And you would think, well, gee, it smelled in those places. It wasn't very nice. But we still came out of there feeling a, a, a reward for having donated time and, and, and made somebody else's day a little bit brighter. And the people that are coming for food often get shamed when they go to the government. But if they come here, they're being honored and, and shown respect and dignity by the people that serve. All right, so I'm going to skip a little faster here because 
you know, he knew he had made a mistake. David understood that he had made a really bad mistake, and he prayed to God, and he said, I'm sorry I took that census. I recognize now that I made a mistake, but forgive me, my guilt. And God said, all right, I'll give you three choices, and he chose the plague from God. None of them were good choices. And God lets loose an epidemic from morning until supper time. From Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 people died in one day because of David's decision. But when the angel reached out over Jerusalem, I'm sorry, yeah, reached out over Jerusalem to destroy it, God felt the pain of the terror and told the angel who was spreading death among the people, enough is enough, pull back. So something about David understanding the nature of God, he said, you know what, I'll choose the mercy of God. Perhaps he'll be merciful on us. And as the angel is coming over and, and destroying people, he gets to Jerusalem and God says, stop. And I wondered, you know, as I studied this a couple years ago, was there something about where the angel stopped that mattered to God? And I found out there was. The angel of God had just reached the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. The same day God came to David and said, go and build an altar to the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. And this man is mentioned in the second book of Samuel, this is from the commentary, who owned the threshing floor on Mount Moriah which David purchased and used as the site for the assembling of an altar to God. Now, if you know your Bible, you know Mount Moriah is where Abraham brought Isaac to sacrifice and where he had his hand up and ready to take the son of promise, the, the very miracle that God had given. He, was, he had so much faith that he was willing to sacrifice his child. And it says in Hebrews, because he believed that God could even raise him from the dead. That's a man of faith. And as the angel's coming over Jerusalem, it's like God says, oh, yeah, right. That's the place of faith. That's where Abraham was. Stop and let David do an altar to me there. And that will cleanse this, this iniquity from our people. What else do we know about sacrifices on Mount Moriah? That's Calvary. That's where Jesus was crucified. So David goes and buys this threshing floor, knowing that Abraham had been there, but not knowing that his son, that was the promise, the son of David, was going to be the ruler. Whew, that's why they wanted to know, can they trace Jesus' heritage back to David? Because that was the promise. Amen? So I just put it this way. God stopped the plague at the threshing floor on Mount Moriah, the same place Abraham willingly offered Isaac, and the same place Jesus would later willingly offer his life as a ransom for all of humanity. And that's the word the Lord gives me for this barn is the threshing floor. All right? I, I feel like it's on a hill for a reason. It can be seen from the road for a reason. I think it's going to be a place of hope for people in this region that, that don't know anything about us. All they know is that they're hungry and they need food and they've got kids and they've got a disability and they can't get back to work or whatever. There could be a million reasons of why they need help. But something's going to be different about this place than the other places they go. And it's only because of God. And that's only because of us. And Lois is, says often, we're not here to just hand them food. We're here to minister to them. We have this privilege of serving people that need help. And they could get, just going to fast forward. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes here. This man uh, is not saved, but he wrote a book called Dominion. And, and he recognizes that Christianity has changed the Western world. Now, he's an atheist, and he says, whether we like it or not, we're all Christians. <laughs> because the, the, the Western culture is built on biblical truth. And, that, and it's like, whether you think you are or not, you follow the Christian doctrine in the way you live. Amazing. Like, how close is he? He, he should be getting saved, this guy, right? And he's on a Christian show, and he says what I'm about to quote you. He says, the cross today, and we have a really big one up on the back wall, and I found out today somebody's here that actually helped hang that cross up on the back wall, so we should give him a hand, Junior, wherever he is. Very cool, big cross. Obviously, I would have liked it to have been on this wall, too, but we got the stained glass window. The cross is what this man, Tom Holland, is talking about. It's probably the most internationally recognizable cultural symbol that humanity has ever devised. But the symbolism of it has been turned on its head. What the cross symbolized for Rome 
and I did the DNA test, and I'm 100% Italian. So, like, these are my relatives, okay? These crazy heathen people that crucified people, that's my cousin Vinny, okay? <laughs> when the cross symbolized for Rome, was, and for those subject to Rome, was the power of the greatest empire on the face of the earth to torture to death anyone who opposed its rule. Sounds like the mafia. The condemned hung naked and were forced to endure hours, perhaps days, of excruciating agony. They became a kind of billboard advertising their own humiliation and the power of the authorities to subject them to that kind of death. In Christ, this atheist is saying, in Christ, this symbol of all symbols has been upended from degra degradation to the notion of triumph. Now, you're the person in the car that's coming to get the food and say, why are these Christians so nice to me? It's because you're not in degradation. You have access to the kingdom of God. And we don't have to ask a lot of questions about whether you deserve it or not. Right now, you're hungry. We're going to give you food. Do we hope you, we can help you get a job? Sure. Nobody wants to be stuck in that place. People by nature would like to be able to take care of themselves. And when they can't, we don't want to shame them because they need help in that moment. So it goes from degradation to the notion of triumph. From humiliation, now the cross means glory. This is an atheist that recognizes this. From death, the cross means life because there's nobody on the cross. He resurrected. <laughs> and even more than that, the idea that someone who suffers the death of a slave is actually the creator of all heaven and earth and of all humanity. What that means in the long run is that it gives dignity to people who previously would not have been afforded dignity by anyone. And you could talk a lot about social justice, but if the love of Jesus is not behind it, that runs out real fast. It's so easy to get canceled. But Jesus doesn't cancel people. That's another day sermon, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to read it again. The cross, in this atheist eyes, gives dignity to people who previously would not have been afforded dignity by anyone. It embeds at the heart of the West that the idea that any victim can triumph over the person who is victimizing him, and that the lowest of the low might, in a sense, be the highest. How can I serve you today? Why do you even care? Because I'm here, and we're... We're providing you a resource that we know you need. And instead of shaming you about it, we want to pray for you so that you can get out of this situation and you'll be able to stand on your own two feet. This is what he said at the end. For the Roman culture, it's hard to emphasize just how radical a concept this is and just how much of a kind of detonation, I love that word, detonation it is on the assumption of the Roman power and the measure of how fast the explosion was. Wow. Now, by and large, we tend to take it for granted that the lowest of the low do have a certain kind of dignity. That's because of Jesus. That's what the cross means. No matter how bad your situation is, there's always still hope for resurrection. Amen. Glory to God. It's a little convicting when the heathens see it before we do, isn't it? <laughs> last, last portion I said, Sermon on the Mount. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's convicting. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And he will then declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And I know we've probably all wrestled with what does that mean? You're saying that somebody could be a Christian and do miracles? And he's saying, I never knew you. And I don't claim to have an answer, and it's 1159, right? So I'm not going to unpack a big one here. Other than I can't get out of my mind Matthew 25, 40, when he says... Blessed are you, come and, and, and enter the rest of the Lord, because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. I was in the hospital. When I needed a place to stay, you opened up your home. Maybe he's saying, I never knew you because you, you saw me all the time. I was the poor people around you, and I never knew you. You didn't stop to help. He said, if you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you're doing it to me. So if you're saying, I never knew you, maybe that's part of it. Well, I don't know. Maybe you could disprove me and 
call me a heretic someday. I don't know, just show me some scripture because until I figure out a better answer, I'm saying I don't need more of a reason than that to get involved with things like feeding hands. The Lord said to do it. I've been blessed by it when I have done it. And I feel our job as a ministry is to provide easier ways so you don't have to go figure this all out yourself. And, and, then, and then we get a blessing for it. Amen? We believe that? All right, this is it. You're a city. I'm sorry. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Let's, let's, when we go down to the barn, let's pray that over that building, that there'll be a glow over that place, that people are riding by on Valley Road and, and Mount Airy, and even on Route 78. Like, what the heck is that light over there? That they'll see a pillar of fire over this place, amen? Because it's a place of hope, and it's a place where God lives. And that, that's what the missionaries said 90 years ago when they dedicated this place. Lord, use this place for your glory. And now we're standing on the shoulders of those people that we'll never get to meet. And I pray 100 years from now, people are still coming to get food at that barn. <laughs> Hope it's a new barn by then, but that's somebody else's problem. Unless the uh, Lord gives me a Methuselah uh, like kind of life, lifespan. <laughs> you are the light, Christians. Don't hide that light under a basket. People don't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the house in the same way. Come on, let's stand up. In the same way, let your light shine. Thank you, Lord. Not just theory, okay? You know, it's, theory's important. We need to know theology. We need to know scripture. We need to give an account for why we believe what we believe. But it's also nice to put your hand to the plow and, and be busy. Be busy about the Father's business. Not everybody, I get it, not everybody's going to want to be in every ministry. We can't all be in everything anyway. But that's all I'm asking is just to pray. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one last little thing. The hardest part of this transition is this period right here, okay? Because two years from now, this is going to be well known in this region and people are going to want to help and other churches are going to want to help and youth groups are going to come and help out and, and that's what happened in Raritan they have more people actually than, that they can actually put to, put to work which is an awesome thing right but in the beginning when it's not well known this is crucial and it's not just show up and, and build boxes it's somebody who's willing to say yes even if it's only in a transitionary period, I'll take on some responsibility until somebody else comes in and fills that need. And God can really honor that. And that's all I'm asking. Just pray. Just pray. Ask the Lord how or if he would want you to be involved, okay? So it says in verse 16, let's read it out loud together. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father. Who One more time. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. So, Lord, we ask you, use us mightily in your kingdom. Use us mightily with people we don't even know, that we would be contagious Christians, that there will be a love and a light inside of us that can't be hidden under a basket, and that we will not be inconvenienced when it's time to help somebody else because we recognize that too much is given, and we've been given much that you ask us to also pay it forward and give it back to others in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. amen.